And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to, coming to us straight from Advanced Guard, Advanced Guard Publishing. Creator of creator of the of several issues of Ki of the Adventures of Kyrie un under their belt, and now going full anthology with the upcoming Wild Tales of Kyrie number one, the one and only, the Mad Matt himself, Matt Crotz. How are you doing today, Matt? <laughs> hey, I'm doing well. I'm I'm doing really good. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a fun time last time about a year ago, I think. So <laughs> yeah, glad to be back. And. Uh, well, um, I would, I would pull the, ho I would pull the Hotel California line, but that's a little too cliche. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, happy, happy to never leave. We have, we have a good time here. So. Yeah, I always tell people join, join the monastery. We have drinks. <laughs> um, cool. But so how, how's um, how you been the last uh, twelve months or thereabouts? Um. You know the the funny thing is when the coof really kicked into overdrive, um, ev a lot of my a lot of my colleagues and some family members gained weight, and, I'm, and I was the only one who lost weight. <laughs> nice. Because I'm right now I'm right now I'm down to two forty, and about the last time I had you on, I was like three fifteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even with your um, with the with the height differential hmm. that you were talking about offline um yeah two i mean 240 is pretty slim i i would imagine for your for a, for a dude of your your size your stature yeah. so that's that's pretty good 240 I, sl I sliced off um five inches off of my waist which was the painful part because it meant a b i meant a bunch, of, a bunch of stuff in my wardrobe had to go i didn't throw it in the yeah. trash i put i sent i sent it over i sent it over to goodwill i'm not i'm not i'm not a complete barbarian yeah, you're not a monster. Yeah. <laughs> um. I don't, I don't know. Some of my coworkers seem to think that every April Fool's Day, because they still haven't let go. They still haven't let go about that whole thing where I ruined everyone's coffee. Hmm. Hope this doesn't have anything to do with dropping five pounds. No. No, it's <laughs> just no. It's just no. The only way I'd make someone drop five pounds with coffee is if I put phenothaline in it, and I'm not doing that. That's overkill. All that I, all that I did was I switched the sh I switched all the sugar with salt. Oh, fun! <laughs> sugar yeah. the sugar with salt. I switched the creamer with co with coconut milk and the powdered creamer with flour. And that and then I went on vac then I went on vacation for about a week to make sure they couldn't catch me while it while everybody was realizing what I did. So by the time yeah everybody... you you gotta have a special relationship with your. Uh... Your coworkers and pull that off. Well, the <laughs> I'm whole assuming thing, you have that. The whole thing started because because somebody was somebody was dumb enough to leave a chocolate cake on my desk on my birthday. I can't have chocolate. Yeah. So was like, and they knew that, I guess. Oh, he oh he knew. I was I was at the, I was at the place for about a year and a half by that point, and I had already made clear during the Halloween party I'm not doing any I can't do any chocolate. Um, yeah, that's a little. Yeah, I mean, you can, um, you deserve some retribution for that, mm -hmm. for sure. And revenge is a dish best served cold, and it gets very cold in Minnesota. Yeah, <laughs> but and a little salty. Yeah. <laughs> well, you what? You never had sea salt ice cream? That's true. Yeah, yeah. And they say. Um, Coffee's a diuretic, and I think salt is too. Mm. But uh, I don't know if your coworkers were getting that down enough to find out. So no, no, they just put out a memo saying that I am not allowed near any coffee machine without supervision. Goodness gracious! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Does... the art practical jokes are an art, and I yeah. am an artist. But. More on more on points. So, 
you so recently <laughs> recently you're 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 heading you're heading back to the wild and wacky world of indiegogo with a anthology series um in the in in the Kyrie um I was going to say cinematic universe but we have more dignity than that <laughs> um Kyrie verse or Kyrie verse depending on how how like you want to say I it? I like Kai Rivers. Maybe we should make that into a hashtag for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's just the like I get it. It's two syllables rather than three, and everyone knows Kyrie Irving. So I catch myself. I mean, I'm saying Kyrie now. It's fine if people want to call it. I've never had a problem with it. Of course, like people, you know, I always say if people know how to uh, spell it to find it on Indiegogo, then mm -hmm. they can pronounce it however they feel like. But yep. uh, I might just start saying Kyrie. So. Um, yeah, that's I, it's good. Yeah, I'm I'm getting back into it, and it's a, uh, it's, it's funny. Like after you do your first one, and you actually fulfill it without going insane, or not without going too insane, and you do get the bug. Uh, you want to get back in the ring again, you know, mm -hmm. and it takes a few months usually. Yeah. You do have to um, uh, detox and debrief yourself for a while and just kind of do in demand orders for a while. Mm -hmm. This is what I did with uh, book two. And um, I sold a lot from book two campaign uh, where I was able to just kind of like save up some money and then hire some artists that I liked to do some short stories. Mm -hmm. To uh, And then I could be uh, fulfilling that while I'm drawing book three. That's kind of the plan, because uh, I don't want to put out... The books one and two I put out, uh, having... Um, I made sure I was I was done with the art by the time they were launching, so it was just a, a printing question for, uh, you know, fulfillment time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't want to I didn't want to break that trend by starting a campaign and then having it run for a year plus. So I just said, you know, in the meantime, let's just have, take a breather. This is an intermission... I'm going to do Wild Tales, give you a bit more of, of the story world, and you can get um, you know get to know the characters a bit more in short slices in terms of uh, stuff that's going to be um, you're going to you're going to see fleshed out in more depth within the stuff that I'm drawing the graphic novels, mm -hmm. but uh, you know while that's coming out and it's kind of and it's a cheaper price point and it's. You know, people think my art's kind of weird, which I completely understand. So I found people whose art style more people appreciate. So I'm just trying to like give people like a, uh, you know, like a bit of a buffet where they can kind of like t taste out uh, what you know Curie stories are with uh, treasure hunting and in heists and uh, secret societies and action adventure stuff across the world and weird cultures. But uh, they can get it um, uh, at, at like a lower price point, like easier access to entry, mm -hmm. you know. And then, uh, you know, once I'm done fulfilling this, then m maybe I'll have the pre-launch pre up for book three done uh, and ready to go by that point. So that's that's kind of what 2021 looks like for Kyrie, at least. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Kyrie, one, Kyrie 1 and 2... Had a very um, had a very fertile crescent atmos atmosphere to them, and for this one for this um, for Wild Tales, you're going with you're going with a more gl a more globe trotting affair where you're dealing with stories ac um, across across the world and across um, across different time periods. Um, what pro what prompted that that idea and what er and what eras are go are going to be presented within the stories in the book? That's a great question. So, uh, something I wanted to explore because uh, I've I've always been a big fan of anthologies, and it's anthologies that really got me into wanting to draw comics to begin with. Was uh, could I give people the start of a because uh, I want to do a Wild Tales uh, number two. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a year from now or so, uh, if people like this one, and so far they seem to like it. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to give them the start of what could you could think of as the sequel, I guess, to the to the graphic novels that wouldn't uh, spoil 
uh, the the stuff I've done so far, but would give you uh, kind of uh, it'd be foreshadowing uh, what I'm going to be doing with these stories, but kind of give you the fallout through time of some of the things that are going to be happening in the stories I'm drawing. So we've got uh, we've got a, a cool uh, chariot race in Palmyra in Syria. Uh, featuring uh, Myra herself, and we've also got a uh, escape escape from Palmyra into uh, uh, India uh, with Paul, with uh, Myra and uh, a new character, uh, this uh, little boy that uh, grows up in her in her uh, care as her ward. Uh, so you're gonna get to meet him, and then you're gonna see some of the consequences of of the. Uh, the things that they're doing uh, later on in life mm. uh, after the Curie books that uh, ripple into uh, the sec Second Anglo-Afghan War <laughs> in 18, uh, 1885, thereabouts, mm -hmm. with um, Dr. Watson and a couple of uh, Rudyard Kipling characters. We get to see uh, that also ripple into uh, 1904 with the... Uh, uh, the Russian and Japanese War, and we get to see a um, the fallout of that a failed invasion by Russia of Japan, and maybe a a, a secret uh, uh, a, a relic from the third century from Myra's uh, time own lifetime that uh, they're trying to smuggle back out of Japan and bring back to to. Um, St. Petersburg to start a uh, an infamous uh, revolution. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's kind of like you get to see, you know, because we're playing with it's all about artifacts and treasure and history, but playing in a supernatural twist on those things. I think it's neat to kind of say, uh, you know, if it's a celebration of all that stuff and and culture and globe trotting, it doesn't have to be in the third century and it doesn't have to be Roman. You know, you can just say like. Uh, the actions of some of these main characters just kind of ripple out through time. And then you can, um, you know, if you, if you play it right and you do your research, you can, you can just, you can pretty much pick a culture in a time period and you can find a way to, to, to weave them, uh, you know, pr pretty convincingly into uh, like a Kyrie verse kind of historical fiction. So yeah. that, that's what I'm doing. So now I hope that answers your question. Oh yeah. Now, given the given the fact that you've mentioned a lot of um, a lot of his a lot of historical event a lot of historical events and a lot of um, historical happenings that you're integrating into uh, into wild ta into wild tales in this case, um, do you plan on do you plan on setting a few pages aside in the in the back to give a little give a little bit of um, context in that regard? Uh... Wait. So, so how? Wait. So how do you mean? Um, um, like, I'll use I'll use a um I'll use an example of of one book uh, from one book that I that I, that I was um fond of a long time ago, and that yeah. is Legend of the Serious Wars or Shun Ranger Shun, and I completely my and forgive me on that my Korean is completely rusty. <laughs> oh, but, cool. Rusty and, Korean. That's cool. But the. But that per that particular um, that particular story was a bit of was uh, was uh, was essentially a Korean take on wu on wuxia, um, taking place in during Korea's Three Kingdoms era. Um, oh, did they have a Three Kingdoms? Yes. For this, you mean the same? Oh, okay, cool. There, nice. there was a there, there was a three there was a Three Kingdoms era. Um, and at the t and in particular, at, in particular, the reason why I bring that up here is, in the back end of the first volume, there were there were a few pages just going into that just going into that um, particular er particular era, um, mm -hmm. es especially especially since at the time one of the larger kingdoms I believe was called Gogurio, and I'm I know I'm mispronouncing mm -hmm. that. Um, was at war with another kingdom, Sila, but Sila was allied with the, um, I believe it was the Tang Dynasty of the Chinese, 
um, Goguryeo ended up having to fight two countries at once. Um, oh, very cool. Oh. Now, I will I will freely admit that I don't I do not consider myself an expert on this topic, but seeing those blurbs acted as a kind of gateway drug for me to explore further on that. And I was and given some of the historical events that you mentioned, I was curious if you had if you had planned on put um, putting a extra in the ba in the back, giving giving like a paragraph of detail to um, some, to some of those to some of those um, conflicts. You know what? That's I I did give myself. Uh, so we've got fifty six story pages across mm -hmm. the three stories in the main issue, and then the twelve page ash can. But I'm still giving myself a bit of buffer room. And I do want to put something supplemental because I, I just think like anthologies work well when you like supplemental content with a anthology. I, mm. I don't know. It just kind of fits, you know, it's just part of the like collage that you're kind of putting together. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a good, um, I know I'm, I'm commissioning a map. So that's, that's one thing that I think will tie it together. Like with the first two, uh, uh, Curie graphic novels like I did like a on the inside cover there's a map and uh, this time I'm doing a map but it's a world map and it's going to show uh, creatures or, or impacting or hunting or impacting the, the story uh, that you're going to see across uh, Wild Tales 1 and hopefully 2 Yeah, and uh, some of them are in this you know book so you can that'll kind of contextualize things and yeah, I probably should do a written um, of some sort. I think it'd be fun to. Yeah, I don't know if it looks like a. Uh, 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 yeah, I have to think about what would be neat to maybe like a, a faux collage kind of thing of clippings or thing. I don't know. Maybe um, Doctor Watson's kind of putting some stuff together. That's one re reason I put Doctor Watson in the ash can is because I thought it'd be really neat to kind of. Um, uh, figure out how to canonically uh, kind of bring something that looks a little more modern that people are already used to being like an you know an investigatory uh, kind of a uh, genre mm -hmm. uh, just kind of marry the two you know so maybe um... oh, no that's a good thank you for that I'm writing that down <laughs> my pleasure yeah um these the the reason why the reason why I bring that up is there is um mm -hmm. when I look at something like Wild Tales one of the one of the phrases that immediately comes to mind is gateway drug um and I yeah. obviously mm -hmm. and I don't mean I don't mean that it, I don't mean that in the literal sense like somebody like somebody's going to be do, going going from one to the other or some or some panic move but more of the fact that much in this much in the same way that reading that reading certain stories we gr we grew up on um mm -hmm. inspired us to dig deeper into various parts of history or culture or even both mm -hmm. um i could easily see something like wild tales being a um be being a beginner's entry into the kind of storytelling that you try and present with Kyrie and essentially being a inroad to the um, to the full size series. Yeah, yeah, right. Like that's um, um, it's so fun because every campaign is kind of a story in itself. You know, mm -hmm. it's really like a dialogue with with uh, backers or potential backers. And so I'm trying to hit all the beats of criticism that I got over the last year. Mm -hmm. You know, one is like people like my colors. Uh, I'm coloring these. Uh, uh, people had to get used to my <laughs> to my drawing style, so I hired other drawers. Uh, people do like my writing, so I'm keeping my writing, or at least co-writing with people. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, they're big and beefy and drawn out, but uh, maybe there's not enough action for some people. So all every one of these stories is more action based. There's... I'm trying to demonstrate. I know how to mm -hmm. tell an action story, so. Yeah, That's there's easier. definitely a pulp vibe. That that I, yeah, I've right. Always, I've always gotten a bit of a pulp vibe from the pre, from the previous two um, graphic novels, but it's definitely more pronounced here. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just trying to. I'm really trying to lean into that. It's not something I could do with the graphic novels. I feel like you can't really tell a romance of the sands epic and have it be pulpy. Like it's it's hard to like take it seriously and do the sort of light pulpy thing that's necessary. I don't know. There's a tension there. Maybe there is a way to do it, but I'm trying to do it. I think it's a lot easier to do it with an anthology. I don't think it's imp- I don't think it's impossible, but mm-hmm. um pulp is pulp is something that does not translate very very well to a to a more drawn out affair cuz if you look yeah. at the if you look at a lot of the early um the early pioneers when it comes to pulp style storytelling it was largely in short stories and a lot a lot of the places yeah. where a lot of famous sf and fantasy writers really got their start was in um and was in anthology publications like say weird tales um yes mhm and mm-hmm. or or if I, if i need to use a more recent example um heavy metal magazine um in both in both cases instead of one instead of one particular story really carrying the load you have a bu- you have a bunch of smaller stories all over the place um even another example i could use is 2000 AD mm-hmm. granted a lot of exactly. people, a lot of people when a lot of people hear 2000 AD they're probably thinking of judge dread but that but it's important to note that that's just one avenue of all the stuff that was in the pages of that. Some, t- I mean, you had you had sl- you had slain, you had rogue trooper, you had a bunch of st- you had a bunch of stuff in those pages. Um, mm. and mm. but but at the same at the same time, trying to trying to do unless you unless you've developed a strong character enough, like what Dread ended up eventually becoming. You can't you can't really do um that you can't really do that sort of pulp in the in the same uh, manner. Um, yeah, no. it's like you can you can hit something mm-hmm. that feels uh that can give you that uh, exciting uh, schlock mm-hmm. uh, feel, and then also can can get serious and get drawn out uh you know across years of content and that's i i rarely think that that's planned you know you don't start a pulpy story no. assuming you're gonna take it more seriously later but sometimes you accidentally discover probably like with dread that you can uh, that you can if you want to um it just depends on what you do you know dread is dread dread going in going in a more going in a more serious route was um was a was a very special case um, large. It largely had to do with the fact that, first, well, for starters, let's, I need to get the obvious out of the way. Dread is meant to be a parody. Uh, he is he is meant to be an extreme parody of the Dirty Harry style cop. Um, mm-hmm. but the writers would would get uh, would get letters unironically unironically approving of of Dread's methods. Some of some of the letters from children. So, as a response as a response to that, that's when they that's when they really started writing stories that were that um either either had him questioning his position or sometimes outright having him in the villain pers- um perspective. You know what that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I guess there was kind of the um uh there was like a cry out for a. <laughs> Law and order and justice, I guess, in seventies uh, cinema and entertainment kind of mm-hmm. stuff. And um, I mean, was was did Dread start in the seventies or was it eighties? Um, Even it's downstream of that Dirty Harry stuff, like you're saying. But, yeah, it 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 very much is. And um, Wagner had written had written a lot of crime fiction even before then. So so. And th- so he had he had that to fall back on, and the whole idea with something like Dread was uh, was asking and answering the question: What if di- what if Dirty Harry actually had had um le- had legal authority to pull all the crap that he did? Oh. Um. It's, it's it's also why that it's also why the Stallone attempt at a film didn't didn't work. But I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um. Oh. But the. Th- the the thing is is that is that well 
while nobody set nobody sets out, you can, it's one of those things where early on a direction has to be um, has to be taken in order in order to set up a foundation. Otherwise, you are the you're doing the literary equivalent of spinning plates, and eventually, mm. one of those plates is going to fall and break. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. I, I guess I guess you need yeah. It's... I suppose um, you need you need to tell the sort of stories, and maybe that's where the light touch of mm. pulp comes in, where the spinning plates becomes part of the fun maybe i'd i'd say no? it's more, i'd say it's more that i um a foundation has to be established one way or the other before before branching out happens the whole you have to understand the rules before you can break them mm -hmm. and that's why it's, like it i if um if you had, if you had, oh, if Wild, if something like Wild Tales was your first, in, was your first introduction, when it comes to when it comes to Kyrie, yeah, um, that it would, it probably, it probably wouldn't be as strong because because you haven't really, you haven't really established the the world that it's trying mm. to inhabit, but you oh wow, out, yeah, but you've put out two volumes. Of the of the world that you that you're trying to establish, so with something like Wild Tales, you have an opportunity to um, explore other avenues that you can't in the in the books proper. At least that's what I'm seeing. I never thought about that, but I think you're onto something because like, I I can tell stories outside of the Curie verse, of course, mm -hmm. but I thought you know like one of the principles that people talk about is you know this idea of um, you don't you don't want to start a new campaign that's entirely broken off completely from the previous campaign i think uh people people or you can that's fine but people would prefer if you had if there was some kind of bridge mm -hmm. you know from the last one if they liked it to the new one and uh though i think the next stuff i'll be doing is going to be more detached you know it's going to be more or its own thing, uh, but from the I guess like the the pulpy um, various genres kind of mashed together um, sort of approach. I guess yeah. You know what? I don't know if this was subconscious or just dumb luck, but probably the latter. Probably, I was I was thinking like hopefully this will and a little column B actually. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Because this, yeah, like I guess, like if if you get if you get the two books and you read them, and if you like them, you see what the heart, I guess, of a of a longer, deeper story, and then you get, uh, and you can you can play around with the light stuff, and then you can see, uh, yeah, you can see me kind of play with slightly different genres. They're all kind of actiony, but some are more, um, like uh, the uh, Russo Japanese War one is a little more. Like cosmic horror, mm -hmm. kind of like in the vein of um, I saw uh, what's his name, Doctor, like some British um, cosmic horror stuff that was that was coming out in the '60s and '70s. It was pretty good. Uh, oh dang, I meant to look it up before I came on, so I can. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, like there's there's other there's you know you don't have you you can do like a ending an artifact and trying to figure out uh, what its consequences are and it doesn't have to be Indiana Jones you can mm -hmm. you can have it be more of a horror vibe like um, you know you could say arguably that's that's kind of what alien is doing uh, you know yeah uh, other other stories have done it so yeah, yeah I guess I'm broadening out I'm trying to give people more a key a key sign of a strong setting in my in my experience is when you're able to tell a variety of um sto of types of stories within mm -hmm. within that setting and it, and it still and they still fit within the puzzle pieces um yeah this is a trick you got you got to really like doing that you can't do it accidentally mm -hmm. sure uh, that's be an afterthought that's what that's why the term often used is Carbonation, a uh, sandbox. Mm. Now, 
the the full the the last two full on um, graphic novels that you've put out have been have been around 140 pages give give or take um i think mm -hmm. i think the i think Kyrie one was 127 pages and two was 149 um and yeah. for, and um for wild tales number 1 you're go, you're going for you're going for um 56 pages total once you factor in the comic and the um ash can um yeah how much? How much did you? How much did your writing style have to change to account to accommodate the fact that you're doing shorter stories? And you always have the good questions. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So if you take, uh, if I was a gardener and not an architect, mm -hmm. uh, I'd be I'd be in a huge mess. I think but as an architect I can plan out I can do like a Tolkien-esque kind of um not you know just only in the sense of like I've, I've got a larger narrative that I've already kind of pinned to the wall and I've already kind of drawn you know I've, I've tied together string between different points and I have like a scaffolding a bigger picture than within that scaffolding um no, which I'm calling like the sequel to Kyrie that will never be made. But within that, I can just kind of like slice out pieces of like poignant moments uh, that that give your imagination something to have fun with. And then you, as the reader, uh, you you can imagine you know another series of novels that kind of you know string them together scene by scene, but. Uh, this is kind of more fun in a way because I get to time jump, as I said, and I, I can uh, I can play more with uh, really decades within the life of, of Myra, the female character. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually, it, I think it'd be kind of harder to write a sequel uh, just for decades when the Curie books are it's over a few months. Uh, I, I don't know how I would time jump that appropriately but i can do it with a series with an anthology you know i can just kind of throw you in and i can i can give you a year in panel one and uh, i can give you like some white hair coming down or some you know i, I can draw her differently or you know th there's ways of doing you in but um I th i'd say it's kind of easier if you if so long as you just if you if you sketch out the big picture you know and i've got that down and you just kind of pick your favorite moments from that big picture, and you serve that up to people. So that's that's really it. Oh, and and then another thing is, it, and this is actually this is what, what's so fun is working with artists. Uh, I'm the artist, and then I either write a story for them. I I pick the story for you know, like I've got several of them written, and then I I make sure like it fits them you know you know what i mean like i don't try to fit them to the story mm -hmm. so that, that kind of informs which of the stories are in carrier one i mean wild tales one because i know like jose garcia has like a really loopy swirly um like filigree kind of uh drawing style and so i know you know i've got this i've got a story that has almost no dialogue in it it's only action, and it's it's like a dance of choreography, and I need someone who just excels at that and naturally wants to draw that, and uh, likes you know clothing and cloth and detail and weird stuff like that. That's so all give the assassin story, mm -hmm. and I know that he'll do better at that than than I could, and also maybe some of the other artists, you know. And then I give the Ukrainian artist Caden Rauk the uh, Russo-Japanese war story because she's really good with uniforms and realism and dark uh, just like masculine characters that have like a uh, intimidation factor like I don't know like mm -hmm. smoldering brooding kind of thing so I I, I make sure that like, I give her that you know it'd be appropriate to give her another one so it's it's kind of I, I like to do it that way you know like as far as artists go I think you need to be very 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 picky about who you hire but once you hire them they really need to have free reign within that sandbox that you 
provide them because you know you, you should be able to trust them a lot mm-hmm. uh, even with making kind of visual story uh, decisions or pushing back on the script because you know, there it's a di- it's a it's you know it's two storytellers on the page whenever you read a comic of course yeah you know so, so yeah so that's that's kind of what it is it's, it's actually easier than it it appears because they're telling it for you you know as well and mm-hmm. um, you know, if you have an eye to picking up what their strengths are and uh, it's it, half the work's already done or half the work they're gonna do you just have to pay them so. Now, speaking of that, with a f- with a few of them, you are you are um, co-writing with with someone else, um, whether it be um, whether it be Matt Rise for for um, the ja- for the Japanese story or um, mm. or or um, Craig or Craig Henderson for one of the for one of the other ones. Um, when it comes to co-writing, is it is it a lot of the t- is it a lot of the two of you bouncing ideas off of each other, and, or someone suggesting an idea and then the other person say, saying, "Well, may- maybe maybe we turn it this or that way because the original doesn't work quite as well." Or how, talk to me about talk to me about how about the adjustment period from writing um writing solo to write to um co-writing. Well, that that Mildred, I have to tell you, it's a lot harder to co-write than it is to just write something and hire an artist for it. <laughs> I really have to tell you, like you write, you hire an artist because you know, a, you probably don't have the time, but also they can do stuff you can't, mm-hmm. and you want to see them do, you know, surprise you every day, and you're paying them to surprise you in good ways, you know. But when it comes to script writing, I think. Um, I don't know, like skill sets, of course, like people's strengths in terms of dialogue and genre. You know, it's it's kind of a Venn diagram, but the Venn diagram is a lot. It's generally going to be, um, there's going to be a lot more overlap. So uh, I, it has been more of a challenge. It's been something I've still, I've welcomed a lot and I've, I'm happy with the, the outcome. We're working with all three of these guys because I'm also the, uh, the um, Dr. Watson story is uh, co-written by um, Larry Bernard. Mm-hmm. Uh, but re- oh, so really, I guess the big challenge, like the way I went at it was I'm trying to produce the story. Like I'm paying to get this thing produced. So I'm even, I'm producing the script. So I'm co-writing in the sense of like I come up with the the pitch and the concept to them, and I need them to put it into 17 pages or 14 pages or something. And so they dialogue it out, you know, for me. They they pace it out through the scenes, and and then there's a lot there's a lot of back and forth about whether or not that that works, you know. And sometimes we have to scrap. I mean, the ash can we went back and forth. I think, I think this is the fourth script is the one we produced because um, and like top to bottom like just start over three times because uh, you know it's, it's an established okay and uh, it was just kind of hard to like you, you know writing an adventure story in 1880 is going to feel different than what people expect from like sword and sandal mm-hmm. and stuff so uh, the dialogue had to feel, you know, you you want to pay homage, like Victorian uh, storytelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's that's a challenge. And, um, yeah, I'd say co. Uh, co- it's it's nice if you come up with a good pitch. I guess I guess the thing is, and it's harder to find um, writers, of course, because a lot of people who say they can write, and um, you kind of have to just find out if they can a lot of times or you can you can read their examples of work but it's even that um you're not usually i think it's probably pretty rare to find someone who's already written something similar to what you want to produce mm-hmm. so that you already know that they can write just the way you want them to do that'd be really nice if i could do that because then that would be equivalent to me hiring um jose garcia Know, to just do what he already does, just do it in India, and mm-hmm. you know we're good to go. 
But, um, I wasn't able to, I'm also kind of hiring people that want to get their chops. Uh, they want to make a name for themselves. <laughs> I'm more than happy to do because I know all three of them have talent. Mm. So I thought well, I'm putting my name on the comic and they're putting their name on the comic and we're going to help kind of elevate and platform them a bit. Uh, so, but um yeah, it's it's tricky. I'd like, man, it'd be it'd be cool. It'd be cool to just be like Mr. Executive Producer if you could just if you knew that you could 100% trust your writers and your artists. Mm -hmm. You could just give them. You could just kind of Stan Lee the whole thing. But I don't. I don't know. I don't know how to get to that point yet. I can do it with artists. I, anyone can do that with artists because it's easy. You know, instantly if an artist is professional, but. Uh, a, a, a writer's professionality is um that's something i don't know that that's a little more elusive uh, these guys are all professional but it, it just takes it's a longer process also so. didn't you didn't you say didn't you say something about um about get about getting the bug so even even if you were able to do the whole executive producer thing i'm not sure if the bug would let you because you'd end up come you'd end up coming back wanting to wanting to write something yeah yeah, and honestly, like, <laughs> I'll tell you something right now. I'll, I'll give you an exclusive, Miltra. <laughs> um, there may be, there may be a fifth story, and it may just be me. Um, it's something I wrote, went back and forth with an artist, and uh, he doesn't have the time for it. And I'm thinking, I never want a short story here to be um, exactly like you see in the graphic novels. Uh, and I never thought I'd draw any of them, but I might just draw it, but just draw it in a different style. And even if it's a character that you already recognize, it's like a, it's a Kyrie character, but I'm just going to approach it in a completely different style. What do you think about that? I'd be, I'd be, <laughs> I'd certainly be curious. And um, <laughs> I'm certain, I'm certain, I'm certain, and far be it from me to get, to get in the way of that. Um, something that there are a couple of things in the, um, in the reward tiers that I was curious how they how they came to be. The yeah. first one, and this is this is the big one, especially with especially with that little mini comic that you put that you put in the thing. What gave you the idea to set up a decoder ring? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, this okay. So this is me. Um, you know, campaign one, Kyrie book one was. Uh, Everyone gets bookmarks and postcards and stuff, right? And I was, I don't know, I was, I was playing around with that. And, like, if you came in on day one, you got three bookmarks. And if you came in on week two, you just got, or week one, you just got two of those. And all this kind of stuff. And that was really hard to keep track of. And I think most people just took them away, which is fine. <laughs> and so the book two, I was like, I'm just going to hire these artists you know, I was I was trying to figure out like, hey, can I just hire artists to to draw stuff and prep for this? Uh, so I was getting them to do posters, and I think people appreciate the posters, but it's you know, it's kind of like, eh. Hmm. But then I then I thought, I'm up some more. Like, how can I give people something that uh, is actually it's literally a part of the store? Like it. Has it lets you be a part of the story even more uh, than uh, any other swag you've seen has been, because that that artifact that that decoder ring is an artifact in the ash can that Doctor Watson finds. He he has to steal it out of a Afghan warlord's tomb before some uh, 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 Sikh uh, lancers can bring it back to the Punjab and reestablish the. Uh, the Sikh Empire, so uh, like so that's that's something you're gonna see in the story. So it's kind of fun to get a piece of the story, you know. And then also like that didn't feel like enough. That still feels a little gimmicky. So I thought, you know, it's not just a decoder ring uh, that you can just use to you know decipher anything. What if I gave you a a code? You know, I gave you a key in the in a code that you can decipher. And that gives you discounts to all future campaigns. So you're getting 20% off everything from now on. 
you know. And every time there's a campaign, I'll email you guys, and then you get you get the code, and then using the key that's in the little scroll that comes with it, you know, you get the code at all, and then you get the, uh, the secret bonus tier. So um, with with the twenty percent off, so and then it becomes a practical value where it pays for itself. Where you you, know, you cross the Rubicon with me. If you're committed and with your interest in Kyrie, then this just lets you, you know, this would this would pay for itself. But um, yeah, you get to kind of like play along the story again too. So mm -hmm. I, I, that's what I'm learning. I think is that people like they want to they want to feel like whatever they're getting in the mail, you know, it's it's Christmas Day, it's your birthday or something. But it's it's not just people are already kind of tired of most of that swag it gets like put in a drawer somewhere or thrown away uh, it, it needs something more so I'm tying it into an actual one of the stories in the anthology and then having it have a practical effect of giving you discounts I think is um is special so it's that that was my idea no and Dakota ring that's also like part of that whole adventure spirit of pulpy uh you know the silly, like celebrating the history, I guess, of what comics have yeah. have done, and so yeah. And speaking of that, there were there were a couple little things in the um, presentation of the cover that I got that I got a kick out of. Uh, one one of which being the way it's presented. It definitely has that old weird tales kind kind of vibe, but also the yeah. fact that up in the corner it you have a stamp that says "Approved by the Rubicon Code Authority." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you appreciate that. Yeah, not yeah. a lot of people saw that, but um, I'm just doubling down on all that. Of, um, the the heritage, I guess, uh, for for good or for worse, the heritage that American comics have been through. It's so. it's one of it's one of it's one of those it's it's one of those in jokes that um that I've that I've seen that I always get a kick out of um when it comes to either. It directly or indirectly throwing back to the to the history of co of comic books, whether it be mm -hmm. that I've seen I've seen some, I've seen more than my fair share of independent comic creators um, homage certain icon homage certain iconic cover arts for various characters, is that's one example of it. I've seen um, mm -hmm. I've seen some people um, have their own little throwback to the Marvel heads that used to be in the t used to be in the um, Top left corner of a comic of, of those yeah, yeah, yeah. comics back in the day. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of it's one of those tongue in cheek things that um it's not it's not going it's obviously not going to distract any, anybody who is mo who is more in is more um more in more invested in the story between the pages, but just a little Easter egg for for veteran comic book fans. Yeah, yeah, and I want to do that more and more, you know, like, I, I just love this idea, like, if you love comics, how can you, how can you honor that legacy while giving people something new, especially when you're, you're playing in the, you know, it doesn't have to be in the pulpy uh, genre, but I don't know, somehow, somehow pulpy feels more heritage driven, I guess, mm -hmm. probably because it died off. <laughs> Like unlike other, you know, superheroes don't feel as heritage driven because you can still find them on bookstands. But um, the, the, just trying to find ways of like celebrate, especially for me, someone who didn't I didn't really grow up on a lot of American comics. So discovering about those the last few years and learning people and listening to people who grew did grow up on that stuff and love it and hear uh, different sides on the. A comics code authority and what you know what the strengths of it what the weaknesses of it were what comics were like before then and uh you know how they've kind of uh were forced to evolve over the decades uh and and really uh succeed and thrive despite censorship or you know a contracting market or exploitation by corporation all that's really interesting and it's fresh to me uh so Doing, doing. I don't know. Try. I'll, I'll probably find some more Easter eggs. Probably in the um, supplemental uh, mm -hmm. stuff that I put out. Thanks to your um, inspiring uh, input there, uh, so I can just kind of 
have, have it be a you know one giant love letter to uh, American comics through the ages. Yep, and of course, of course, of course, stuff through stuff like this, it also there's it's been it's been very interesting looking at the looking at the rise of independent comics over over the last over the last five or so years. Um, mm-hmm. large, largely because of the fact that it's it's helping to dissuade a certain notion that a lot of people had when it came when it came to comic books. That mm-hmm. and that and I will I will freely admit that this is more of a American thing than it is anything else. But mm-hmm. there's been there's been a stereotype for as long for as long as I can remember that the only um, that com- that the only comic books are um superhero comics and obviously if you look yeah. at say the com- the comic book scene in Europe that's hardly the case the adventure comic took had more of a hold over there than superheroes not that not that people didn't try when it came to superheroes it just didn't stick and I'd say yeah I'd and say, I, I go back and forth to this all the time with people I, I have no idea I think part of it I guess was you know, a lot of stuff was succeeding. You know, it, I love America, but I don't think naturally, I don't think Americans just want to read superhero comics that much more and don't want to read anything else in the comics medium. The, re- like, the reason and, why su- the reason why superhero why superhero comics had su- had such a massive foothold was because that yeah, was please. the main survivor after um, Frederick Wortham had to mm-hmm. go mess everything up for everybody. Yeah, right. Because people, I mean, Americans were reading uh, mystery and thriller and romance and horror mm-hmm. just as much as Europeans and uh, you know Japanese people today. And right, like it was just, of course, like a, a novel isn't. I think we probably talked about this a year ago. Yeah. But uh, you know, when you think of like novels, you don't think of um, a particular genre. But in America, I guess most people think of a particular genre. <laughs> Just because of because of that um, intrusion, I guess. Into, yeah, uh, because that yeah. that the prob- the thing is that's been that kind of thing has been grandfathered in over not just a f- not just a few years, but several but several decades. Because mm. I'd say I'd say I'd say it's been grandfathered in all the way since the Silver Age, and that was back in the sixties. Oh. oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Didn't things kind of die out? Like, I mean, Stan Lee had to. <laughs> weren't like superheroes were basically dead and Stan Lee figured out how to um revive it right as a genre um with uh, Fantastic what, en- Four what and... ended up happening is um first off let me state that the silver age of superhero comics was bonkers <laughs> there yeah. there was some there was some weird ass stuff that I could only that I can only ascribe to drug use during some with some of those comics it got weird and a, a lot <laughs> of the, a lot of that silliness was a good was a good chunk of the industry um o- tr- um overcompensating for f- for um Frederick Wortham's infamous seduction of the innocent book which for all intents yeah. and purposes was a hit piece it it was it was the it was the equivalent it was the equivalent of a of um a games journalist nowadays it's just that it, it's just that it wow. ended up prompting a whole lot more a whole lot of negative press and that was the reason and then you had the Comics Code Authority trying to come, trying to um, establish itself to be a um, face saver. Um, I got, I don't want to go too deep into it, and because uh, because I don't want I don't want to derail. But um, no, it's that... it's all it's all interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but no, I get you. Like I, I'm tracking with you. It's um, it's, but... it's a unique event. Uh, it was a seismic event in American history that other industries did not have to yeah. deal with in other countries and, and it's it yeah that's because, why that's why we are today because know. of that a lot because of that a lot of the a lot a lot of um other a lot of other genres um start started to started to fa- started to fade off because of, because of that because of that controversy um and it was and um it wasn't it it wasn't until the it wasn't until um 
you start you started to have pe you started to have people kind kind of get tired of the of the rampant silliness throughout the sil throughout the Silver Age that it transitioned into what's known as the Bronze Age, which is really the uh, the Bronze Age is really the the era where um where St where Stanley and company were start were starting to make their mark. Oh um, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And that start that started around the uh, around the uh, mid 70s um no I guess does I'm... bronze have anything to do with um if that's is that like an indication of quality too you know like gold silver bronze or is that just it, it was it was it was more not the, of it, it was more a passage because it's mm -hmm. because um the or the the re the early d the early days of like first generation sewer manor like that's referred to as the golden age um, yeah. Then you then obviously you that that should that's the foundational age. It should probably be the golden one. Yeah. yeah. Um. Now, obviously, I didn't come up with this whole, with this whole age thing. It it was well established before I even got into comics. But oh. that's generally the the approach that's taken. But in. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there was a similar age thing with co with comic history in U in Europe because, obviously, for a lot of for a lot of the industry in Europe, I'm going to be dealing with language barriers, so I have no way to tell. Um, what I do, what I do know is that it leaned more towards the pulp end of things. Um, I say a large part a large part of it has to do with the comic book scene in France and the popularity of works like Tintin. Mm -hmm. Um, especially since you're dealing with a time where a lot of your a lot where um a lot of post-war Europe was starting to open up and people were starting to travel between countries. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's that's my yeah. that's my conjecture at the very least. Um, no, I think I think their their wonder at the legacy and access of empire, I guess. You know, where like their little country of Belgium you know, had had a really long reach, where America huge, but it's it it has a legacy of trying, you know, just trying to figure its own thing out mm -hmm. um, throughout the 20th century. So it was, um, I guess, uh, I don't know if there's as many. From my understanding, there isn't as much, um, you know. Hey, we got to go travel ha halfway across the world and go do this thing over here, kind of stuff. It was more like, you know, it starts off with uh, Nemo and Slumberland, kind of stuff, and then goes into westerns and other other kind of concepts. Yeah. For that reason, I guess, because we're we got enough we got enough to deal with right here. Mm -hmm. And then they they were always thinking outward, I guess, from uh, politically, and I guess for a lot of reasons. Yeah, it's like you're saying that's interesting. It's what it's now. Obviously, I'm obviously I'm not give I'm not giving a um co a comprehensive view view on the on the thing, and I'm and I don't consider myself an expert on the ma on the matter. This is this is just my own obs this is just my own observations. Um, but in the last few years with the with the independence, the the um, and I'd I'd say a combination of that and the st and the status of the superhero end of things from major publishers have kind of sh have kind of shaken that particular assumption. It wasn't just one thing. It wasn't just one thing, but a but a um a case of death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. And when I look when I look back at a lot of the a lot of the comic books that I've that I've backed over the last three years. Um, yeah, the majority of them have not been superhero comics. There's only, there's only been like, yeah. I'd say like twenty percent of the ones that I've backed have been superhero comics. Oh well, and you you probably have to look for them to to get to twenty percent. Um, there's a little more in 2021, but I mean speaking from 2018 on, uh, yeah, sure, it's a minority for sure. Yeah, yeah, and when I when I say superhero, I mean pu I mean. I don't mean something that's downstream from su from superhero like like say a super story that that has a that has a storytelling motif more more akin to noir or spy fiction. That's not what I'm referring to with that. I'm referring to what's no. been lovingly nicknamed cape shit. 
Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd say, like, wouldn't uh, even Cyberfrog is, um, like, adjacent to I Superhero, would, but I, would I, hesit- I don't know I if I'd call hesit- it Superhero. I would, I would be extremely hesitant to refer to refer to Cyberfrog as a as a superhero story in that sense. Yeah. Um, could I potentially see it? Yeah, but there's but there's other elements that are far stronger than that. It's it's more of what's the um, what's the do, what's the dominant paint on the on the canvas. Mm-hmm. Um. Mm-hmm. And when, when it comes to, but when it comes to, um, when it comes to, when it comes to Kyrie, now, get, just to get, just to get back on the, <laughs> on the rails. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. It's easy to do. Once you start talking about comics go to the work, I mean, once anyone does, once I do. I, fi- so, yeah. I find, I find the, I find the series of events that leads to a thing fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. I'm not trying to say that I'm a that I'm a historian in that regard, but I definitely have leanings. But, so, but um, first off, I do want to congratulate you on managing to surpass, on managing to get over your goal ten times over. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's that's easy to do, honestly. When uh, that was a real goal, and that mm-hmm. um, just because I saved, you know. It's our the goal can already made for with Curie book two profit so mm-hmm. yeah it looks impressive but yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you. What are you shooting for as far as a release window for um for Curie and I'll I'll start and more specifically the digital version because I know the printed version is going to take a significant amount longer. Well. Uh, well, here's here's the the cool thing is that I don't. Um, there's no reason to think because I'm printing in the same state I live in this time around. Uh, there's no reason to think that the uh, printed edition is going to take any you know, more than a couple weeks longer than the uh, digital, which is nice. Uh, and uh, almost every page is already. Uh, uh, drawn, lettered, and inked. It just requires me to color them. Months um, thereabouts to color them. So it's going to be this uh, late late summer is what I'm shooting for. I think I said September on the campaign so that I can pull it off early and make people happy that way. But um, it's going to it's going to be you know that's relatively fast in this Indiegogo sphere, as you know. But um, yeah, they all. The, I, I, I tried to set this up. I, I planned this out. Um, people started working on art from at least September, I think. So I, I wanted to make sure I was the last person in line, uh, that everything was, uh, you know, we're just waiting on me and no one else. Mm-hmm. So it's just going to take a few months, including all the swags done and all the um, the D- Dakota rings are getting they're getting printed now, actually. As of yesterday, so it's just a uh, just waiting on me to color. So. Oh, all right, and I'll will certainly be looking forward to how to how it um, develops. <clears throat> and but with with all that said, I do want to once again sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come back up to the temple and enjoy the insanity that happens here. Oh, of course. Yeah, Mildred, I, I really appreciate you uh, reaching out again because it's um, we had a fun time talking last time and uh, life, a lot of life has happened <laughs> between uh, the early 2020 or whenever it was and uh, the 2021 now. But uh, yeah, it's it's fun and I appreciate uh, I appreciate your um, suggestions as and I'm very thankful that uh notes i'm trying to hit that you're picking up on those <laughs> especially as someone who knows a lot more about comics than i do uh is particularly the history of them um and i'm 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 not that i was trying to make sure i wouldn't be tone deaf to what american comics you know as a legacy medium kind of has done uh you know mm-hmm. and uh 
I'm pulling that off, and I'm I'm glad I'm glad to hear it. And uh, yeah, this is, this is another successful campaign, and we're just gonna fulfill it, and then we're gonna be you know it's gonna be onward and upward. So I gotcha. And of course, of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As oh, thanks. I often, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>